Sure. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to uh, the, the final panel of, uh, of this afternoon's session. I'm John Godfrey, joined on stage by a terrific and distinguished group of panelists. Their, their complete biographies are available on the SDC website in the speakers section, so I'm not going to go through, uh, through in great detail, uh, or really any detail, but just introduce uh, in order. Uh, to my immediate left is Bakul Patel, who just gave us a terrific keynote presentation uh, from the perspective of the Food and Drug Administration. Bakul is the Associate Director for Digital Health. Next to him is Reese Hirsch, who's a partner with Morgan and Lewis here in San Francisco and uh, a real expert in privacy law. To his left is Anand Dyer, who is Chief Data Science Officer from WellDoc, a company based uh, in my part of the country over in Baltimore, Maryland. And finally, Dr. Michael Blum, uh, who is Associate Vice Chancellor for Informatics at UC San Francisco. And we're going to be talking to you today about navigating the uh, FDA regulatory process and also dealing with privacy, which goes beyond the FDA. So uh, we've, we've heard a lot about how the FDA ensures that uh, medical devices and apps are safe and effective. That was the, the topic of the, the panel we just heard. Now I'd like to color in a little more of the picture by turning to data privacy to start off the panel. Uh, the, the kinds of information that devices are collecting, whether it's purely health and fitness or certainly if it's medical in nature, is very sensitive and, and personal to consumers. So, um, Reese, I wonder if you could set the stage for us by just giving us, a, 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 as an opening, a, a high-level overview about how regulations affect the types of information that developers might be collecting through their, their apps and devices and what they, you know, what they need to know as a, at the start. Sure. Uh, the way that privacy and security regulation applies to smart health apps will vary to a large degree depending on who the customer is. Let's say that you're offering a smart health, health app that is directed to a HIPAA-covered entity, like a hospital or a medical group. And I should start by saying that for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It's the federal medical privacy law, and it applies to covered entities, which include health plans and a wide range of health care providers. But it also regulates business associates, which would be a vendor that acts on behalf of a HIPAA-covered entity and gets protected health information or individually identifiable data from that covered entity in the course of providing a service. So if a mobile health app is offered to a hospital, let's say, and you're hosting patient data on behalf of that hospital, then most likely you would be a business associate regulated under HIPAA. In contrast, though, if you're offering a, a mobile health app to a consumer or patient as an individual and not to a healthcare provider or health plan, then you're probably going to be outside of HIPAA regulation, but there, are, there is a whole other framework of privacy and security regulations that will affect how you develop your product. And those are primarily from the Federal Trade Commission, which has broad general jurisdiction over privacy and security issues. And also um, agencies like the California Attorney General's Office has taken a strong interest in mobile app developers and California tends to be on the cutting edge of privacy regulation and mobile apps are no exception. So that's sort of the high level overview of, of who regulates mobile health apps. But a lot of the first question to ask is who is your customer because a lot will branch from that decision. So it sounds like everyone in the room who's developing a health-related app or service or device is, is going to have to think about privacy regulation at some level, but the type depends on who the customer will be. That's right. HIPAA is certainly a more prescriptive, detailed kind of regulation, but uh, there's no escape from you know, seriously considering, considering and incorporating privacy and security into your products. Okay. I'm going to want to come back to you in a little bit, Reese, and get a little more detail about exactly what those requirements are. But I want to give 
our, uh, uh, turn to some of our other panelists. Uh, so Anand, um, I'd like to hear a little bit, uh, the audience would like to hear a little bit about WellDoc. Uh, tell us a little about, about the, the offering that you have for managing diabetes and what kinds of information it collects and then how you had to take both privacy and FDA, FDA regulation into account when you brought it to market. Yeah, sure. Um, for some of you who might have been here uh, when Chris Bergstrom presented earlier on, um, we talked about a product, uh, Blue Star, um, which is uh, what we affectionately call mobile prescription therapy. Software as a drug. Uh, uh, I like to think of it in that way. Um, but when we started the journey, uh, when you think about diabetes, and in fact any other chronic condition uh, uh, that a patient may have, I'm a type 2 diabetes patient myself and I use our product, so for me it's kind of it's a personal journey. Um, and there's really two issues any chronic patient suffers. Um, one is that the right data is not getting to the right person at the right place at the right time. Uh, and, and that's a problem largely with connectivity. Every other industry in the world has solved that problem. Um, but the more challenging one is how do you convert that data into meaningful information, knowledge, action, and presumably outcomes. Both the numerator outcomes means health outcomes and the denominator outcomes so cost reductions. And, and that's a harder problem because at that point in time you're really talking about not just incenting a behavior change with the patient, but sustaining that. And perhaps even doing the same thing with the provider. Okay? And when we embarked on the journey of this mobile prescription therapy, we said we really needed to do three things. And those three things were can you coach a patient in real time? They put in uh, values, they get feedback on what to do. Um, and of course the feedback that they get is going to be different based on their med regimen that their doctors put them on, which is why it's a prescribed product. Um, the medical history that they have, perhaps their comorbid conditions, because rules will change based on if I'm just diabetes or diabetes and hypertension or whatever. Uh, and then, and then uh, uh, their own psychosocial preferences. Because the way I maybe want a message is, you know, just give me the skinny versus somebody else may actually want the hand holding, they're new to insulin, things like that. So he said, could we coach the patient in real time and longitudinally? Second, could we create this cloud-based, if you would, expert system that looked at patterns, glucose patterns, testing patterns, medication patterns, etc., and used evidence-based guidelines to then suggest back to the patient if there was a behavior modification to be made, but more importantly, provide a report to the doctor say every three months, the day before the patient came in and said, hey doc, this is where they were, this is where they are, this is what's changed, this is what evidence suggests you might want to do, but you're the doctor, do what you think is appropriate. So it's those three things of patient coach expert system and what we call clinical decision support for the provider. And where that has evolved to today is it's prescribed by a doctor, uh, it actually has an NDC code uh, that's assigned uh, to the product, just like any other drug in the US. It's been through all the randomized control studies and published outcomes uh, to show uh, uh, very significant benefit, oftentimes two to three to four times better than drugs alone. Uh, and it's been through the guidelines and rails of ensuring what Bakul talked about, which was patient safety. So it's, it's, it's a class two uh, 510K cleared medical device. And if you think about those three things and you think about regulatory, the honest truth is you know, I didn't know Bakul and he didn't know me way back when, when we first made our submission. And we didn't know much about the FDA and honestly they didn't know much about, this is 2007, there was no guidance document available at that time. And, and so we said, well, if you look at the laws that are out there, we fall underneath this class two kind of space based on two things. One is we were taking data from a predicate medical device, in this case it was a blood glucose meter, so you're an accessory, if you would. Uh, at the second thing is you're falling underneath that general treating, mitigating, or diagnosing a disease, which puts you into Bakul's matrix of uh, where you fall in the classification spectrum and where you fall in the patient risk uh, spectrum. And so one of the things we did was we said, well, we have to assess what risk is. And risk, of course, is occurrence of risk times the severity, and it's a product of the two. And for us, risk meant many different things that we didn't, now it's very obvious what these things are. It wasn't obvious then. So for example, there's risk in usability. Uh, how do you take a patient who's elderly uh, who may have significant neuropathy 
and give them a touch screen phone and say, we want you to enter this data in. And they can't even feel the phone. <laughs> They've lost all tactile sensation. So you want to make sure that the data they enter is correct. And that's, a, that's, a, that's one use case that demonstrates in a simple case like that where you and I may think, oh, that's easy, that there's actually risk associated with that. So then what you have to do is you have to demonstrate using your test cases that you're not incurring any additional risk to the patient, that they can actually conduct the exercises you ask them to do or the use cases you ask them to do and perform against a certain set of uh, these instructions and get to the right outcome, right? Um, it means ensuring that the actual data that's entered on these devices is protected from a privacy perspective. That means you have to follow the proper encryption guidelines, the proper authentication guidelines, the proper non-repudiation. And, and these things are actually well published by NIST. Uh, uh, and so we used, you know, we maybe overkill in 2007, but now we're glad we did. We used you know, AES 128-bit encryption saying, you know what, this is actually going to allow us to stay above the line and make sure that we are protecting that information. And so for us, when you look at what mobile prescription therapy is and you look at um, uh, this notion of regulation and you look at the notion of, of these things had to be architected and built from the grounds up, inside. Uh, you can't scotch tape. Uh, security, you can't scotch tape privacy onto a product once the product's developed. And to Bakul's point earlier on that he made in his talk, it's, it's about managing the risk, if you would, but not at the end as one monolithic event. Don't come to the end and say, okay, you know what, I'm, here, here it is, FDA. Work systematically along the way to identify these risks and to catalog these risks and show the proper evidence in your tests and show the proper evidence in your uh, quality system that you're following a repeatable scalable, uh, predictable process. And I think that's the learning for us uh, as it relates to regulation and, and privacy in this mobile prescription therapy journey. Uh, you know, you remind me of something. Uh, my wife is a visual artist, a painter, and, and people often ask her, well, how long did it take you to paint that? And she said, the right answer is, all my life. Because you learn as you, and develop your skills. And actually, I think how long it takes you to get F an FDA clearance depends not just on how long it is from when you submit your application until you receive the clearance, but how well prepared you were mm -hmm. before you got to that stage. And I want to circle back to that in a, in a minute with you, Anand. But uh, uh, Michael, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, so much of what, we, uh, so much of what we're, we're talking about here is a revolution in healthcare information that's very, it's real time, it's continuous, it's connected to the consumer, the patient in new ways, maybe because it's on a device that they carry with them all the time that's always connected. So that's great, that opens up some new possibilities. Uh, but at the same time, in the clinical setting, uh, I think it raises some concerns about both the, the privacy of that data, how, how you manage it, and also the reliability of that data. Can you, can you comment on that a little bit and, and how just in general in your role with informatics you think about uh, the correct way to use in, uh, patient data that didn't get collected in the hospital but actually came from some other place? Sure, there, there's a lot in there. Um, about four questions. So let, I would start kind of where, uh, where Bakul left off in his talk that we're, we're data obese right now. So everyone's under this, this belief that if we can accumulate and then aggregate more data, everything's going to be better. And I think that's a little bit of a fantasy. We have lots and lots of data now. What we need is the right data at the right time, um, allowing better decision making. And we need data that we can turn into information. So um, from the healthcare provider perspective, we've been used to since, I don't know, 2000, what, when was, 1999, when was HIPAA? Right. First, first Statute 96. 96, yeah. yeah. So, so we've been doing this for quite some time, and it's just ingrained in our DNA now that all of the data needs to be protected. Any data that we see um, has to be protected. Essentially, I mean, the, the regulation says to reasonably contemporary standards. Um, there have been so many data breaches and there's been so much publicity around them. Um, but even aside from that, it's our fundamental responsibility to protect the data of the patient, to protect the patient and therefore the data and the information of the patient. So 
when you think about designing a device that is going to touch anywhere in the provider network, it needs to have started with that fundamental notion that this data needs to be protected. There can't be holes anywhere. And I agree with the other speakers that that's something that has to start at the beginning. You can't come along in the, in the process and say, OK, now we're going to start. You know. We actually, when we, when we talk to any innovators, any startups or even um, sophisticated companies, one of the first things we'll start the engagement with is a, a, a privacy and security review of the device or of the application to make sure we don't get down the road of engaging the providers, engaging the patients, only to find out that there's a big security or privacy flaw that blows the whole thing up. Um, the, the ability to um, receive streaming data is really going to be a game changer. I, don't think it is yet because um, there's a big um, last mile between the streaming data that zips up to the cloud, as you've seen in many pitch decks, um, where there's data that's somehow Bluetoothed up to some, from some device to an iPhone or a Galaxy, and it's up in the cloud. Um, and everyone then assumes that that's also zipping right to your provider. And the reality is it's not zipping anywhere out of the cloud. It's sitting at the cloud. And you, you gave the example of, um, and when you see your provider every three months, you bring them a report. That, in my mind, not to be at all disparaging, because that's a huge amount of progress, but where we need to get is where that streaming data gets analyzed, gets aggregated appropriately, gets turned into information, and in real time or near real time is available to the provider, using the provider as, as a big word. So anyone in the provider's practice, whether it's the provider themselves, an extender, um, any kind of additionally licensed person, but the, the information is getting to the right person so they can interact with the patient in real time. So if you have, um, if you have a type 1 diabetic, for instance, and they have a, a hypoglycemic event, they're not waiting until their three-month visit or their six-month visit for someone to say to them, hey, what happened to you, you know, nine weeks ago when you had a blood sugar that was really low? They get a call from the office then, and they have a conversation about what happened then. So we're not there yet. That's where we all want to be, and we all want to get there very quickly. And that's going to put tremendous pressure on the systems in the provider offices to be able to handle those kinds of high frequency streaming data um, that's very different than how we deal with things now. Um, but it's something that we've got to work through because all of what Nicole talked about, about the changes, new vital signs, new concepts of how we treat patients are going to be critically dependent on all of that data getting to us and getting aggregated into information. And uh, so when this information uh, is flowing in, in, huger, you know, in huge streams uh, uh, to, the, to the clinical care providers. What is the obstacle that you see that's keeping us from getting to that point uh, sooner? Is it because it would overwhelm their systems, or are there other things? Um, so you touched on a little bit of it initially. Um, it's the, first of all, it's the veracity of the data. There's no system for knowing what the provenance really is of the data, what it's coming from. There's not enough experience with the devices yet. What is sending me all this high-frequency data? Where is it coming from? How do I know that's a device that's been validated by someone? So we need to see more of these devices coming through, more of these systems coming through, going through the FDA approval process. So they've got some stamp that we actually know that, that this is real data. So that's, that's one piece of it. That, that'll happen first, is the devices will go through the process so we're relatively comfortable that the data is real. But then the systems that we work with um, on the provider side are not ready yet to handle any kind of data that's coming in with this frequency, even modest frequency data gets difficult to manage in, in our current systems. The electronic health records are incredibly valuable. They are very sophisticated workflow engines that run incredibly sophisticated organizations. Um, everyone likes to beat up on them because they use older technology or their user interfaces are pretty unsexy. Um, but the reality is they are, are incredibly sophisticated workflow engines, but they weren't designed with this in mind. So that's probably the biggest barrier is where is all this going to come? How is it going to be displayed? What are the workflows and the interactions with the providers and the provider extenders to act on all this? And then the last piece is the standards around how this data is going to move around. And that's 
currently in evolution, many, many very smart folks trying to figure out how do you describe this data, how do you attach the right metadata to it so you know where it came from, what it says, what the bounds are, um, and it can go into systems that are ready to accept it. So just maybe to build on a couple of these thoughts, so um, there's the beginning of a framework here. Um, so um, mm -hmm. I'm charting new territory. So if I'm wrong, forgive me. <laughs> um, there's two, if you were to describe data in healthcare today, there's two dimensions that are germane to this discussion. One is this concept of frequency, right? Is it coming at a low frequency, uh, which may be my meds that I change every six months or a year, or it may be my psychosocial profile that doesn't change every day. And then there's, of course, high frequency data that's many times a day engaging with your glucose, blood pressure, weight, whatever, you know, food intake, all that stuff, activity. And then there's the source of that data, the second dimension, which is, is it coming from a healthcare system, which means there's some trust associated with it, arguably, uh, or is it coming from the patient themselves? And today, the vast majority, if you were to take healthcare and put it into this two by two thing, the vast majority of data sits in the bottom quadrant, why? It's being generated by a system and it's coming at a low frequency, you know, it claims data that may be a year old or whatever. And what mobility is taxing the system with is it's exploding this data in three ways, right? And all of a sudden now the question gets asked, well then how do you match the flow rate of that data if I think of a flow rate of water in a pipe, and I, I, I don't want to have turbulence. And I have turbulence where the pipe shrinks and gets bigger. And so I have to match the flow rate of that data to match the absorption rate of the stakeholders of that data. So for example, your hypoglycemic event. Uh, in Blue Star, if the patient's having a hypoglycemic event, they get coached right then and there. The system coaches them. So it doesn't go to anybody. They, they fix their problem. If it happens three times in a 10-day period, the system works with them longitudinally. So it's working with them at a different frequency. And then, of course, if the meds need to be adjusted, maybe that's a point of intervention for the doctor. But the point that I think is really critical is this frequency concept is something that is going to challenge the healthcare system in general. What EMR today captures real-time data? They don't. It's not their fields don't exist for that. Right? Well, that's not really true. So we capture real-time data coming off our ICU monitors and all of that stuff. True, true, true. I'm thinking of this chronic, you know. Well, I would say that, that the frequency piece of it um, into the record isn't, isn't really the problem. It's what do you do with all exactly. the data, right? Exactly. So, so we have to change the paradigm from just reporting on all this frequency stuff and displaying it in spreadsheets, which becomes useless, exactly. to doing the analytics on it, to do the exception reporting or the out-of-bounds reporting or well, the behavior reporting. Right. All right. Right. So by cool, uh, the FDA must be thinking about some, some of these exact same kinds of issues. You're not a privacy regulatory agency, but nevertheless, you have to be concerned when you're analyzing the safety and efficacy of medical devices with how they handle the data. Uh, we've talked about a number of dimensions here already, but how does, how does the FDA look at an application that's coming in from a developer for clearance or even for approval uh, in terms of how it handles the patient's data? Yeah, so as I talked in my, in my uh, previous talk, we talked with our first lens is patient safety. So how you can protect patient safety comes from many, many, many different dimensions. You know, technological aspects, uh, usability aspects, um, data privacy aspects. So if any of those things, uh, so when we ask people to manage risk, you know, now, when I talked about risk management, when I say people should manage risk, they should consider all the aspects. And doesn't mean that because we don't in a, have in our purview to talk about what HIPAA does, that does not mean that because of a lack of uh, privacy, it could cause could or could not cause a safety concern. If, if, the, if the manufacturer of the product or developer of the product addresses or thinks about that and addresses it. The, and sort of says that regardless, for a, you know, give an extreme example, if the data is shared or not shared, it still will not have any effect on the patients, that's okay for us. But if, if our data is accidentally shared when it was not intended to, would actually have a bad consequence on the patient, that, that, would, that would bother us. That's, a, that's what reviewers are looking for, is saying, when this thing does not work as intended, and that's, you know, that's our language, saying when the product does not work as intended and can cause harm to patients, 
that's what we are that's what reviewers are asked to look for and so as part of that you peel back and go have you done risk management you peel back further and go okay where where have you looked for risk management or risk to patients and we look for many different aspects security of data is a classic example lack of security or lack of encryption can cause patient harm it may cause privacy harm uh, from a different perspective but that's not the concern we are when it causes patient harm is when we would be asking questions. How, what have you done to solve that to minimize that risk? So, okay. Uh, Reese, uh, so in addition to the developers having to maintain the security of the data to make sure that there's no patient harm, they also have a, a right to privacy uh, because of HIPAA. So who, who would enforce those HIPAA obligations is there someone for developers to go to, to for advice, or is there a resource they can go to understand exactly what's required, or is it all uh, industry standards and, and kind of voluntary best practices that they just should learn from and do their best? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I'd say in the HIPAA area, uh, a app developer would be well served to go to the Office for Civil Rights website and look at some of the general information there about the obligations of HIPAA business associates. And just to make sure everybody caught it, it's the Office of Civil Rights in the... Within the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and I brought along two documents that if you're not in the HIPAA regulated sphere, but you're doing a, a health and fitness app that's under the Federal Trade Commission, sphere of privacy regulation, then I think you'd really benefit from looking at these two documents. Uh, both came out in early 2013, and this one is from the Federal Trade Commission in February 2013. It's Mobile Privacy Disclosures, Building Trust Through Transparency. And it provides a lot of good sort of uh, practical common sense tips for app developers. and and basically all the different participants in the mobile ecosystem. And then along the same lines, and this is kind of goes with the theme I, I touched on earlier, California is always getting out in front on privacy issues. And before the FTC could come out with its guidance in January 2013, uh, the California Attorney General Office beat them to it with this document, uh, which is sort of similar in intent it's called Privacy on the Go, Recommendations for the Mobile Ecosystem. And it also speaks about good privacy practices for mobile app developers. And it has a lot that's specific to app developers. But I also wanted to um, you know, touch on something that everyone has, has hit upon in the regulatory sphere. Michael and Anand and Bakul all said you need to think about regulatory issues on the front end. And that's also very true in the privacy area as well. And there's a, a concept that the Federal Trade Commission uses called privacy by design. And they, they cite this a lot now in their enforcement actions. And the basic principle is, is a simple one, that you think about privacy when you're designing your product, whether it's a mobile app or, or any other device or product. And you bake it into your, your system so you don't have to uh, remediate later because the FTC has stepped in in some very high profile situations and told major technology companies that they had to back off a product and basically take it off the market because it wasn't built in a way that took into consideration consumer privacy issues. So I also wanted to just highlight a couple of the, the major rules, you know, sort of the practical common sense guidelines you know, for app developers, whether you're in the FTC realm or the HIPAA Office for Civil Rights realm. And if you're working under the FTC guidelines, the basic rule is you need to post a privacy policy that explains how you collect, use, and disclose personal information. And uh, you need to make sure that that policy is complete and accurate and not misleading. Because if it is misleading, it can be a basis for enforcement action by the FTC or an attorney general. And in those two documents that I just highlighted, there's this concept of just-in-time notification. And it's not a legal requirement, but it's definitely an emerging best practice that both the California AG and the FTC are endorsing. 
And for a, an app developer, that means that when the consumer is at a critical juncture in using your app, and they're about to make a choice that's going to lead to some either disclosure of information that hadn't occurred before, or you're, they're about to provide you with some sensitive information like geolocation data. You're not required to, but they think it's a good idea to flag that at the time with maybe a pop-up box so that the user can click their acceptance and recognize that they, and consent to that additional action. And that's something that you know, if you can build it in, you know, if it's feasible and it works for you, then it's going to look good to regulators if you come under scrutiny. And another basic principle from the FTC side is they want consumers to have the ability to read the privacy policy before they download the app. So they want it to be in the app store where you have the opportunity to read it before downloading. And some of those requirements aren't only from the FTC, but also from the California Attorney General. Right. There's a lot of overlap between those yeah. two. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming, I think probably safely, that some of the folks in the audience uh, either have not yet developed a, a health and fitness app, but are planning to, or have developed health and fitness, but have not yet moved into the medical space, the medical regulated space. So. Um, our goal in having this panel is to encourage you, to urge you to be innovative and move forward and don't think of the regulations as something that's going to stop you. It should be something that helps guide you on the path to do the right thing and stay safe and legal. Uh, we have some people here who have vast experience with uh, either in Anand's case, working for a startup company, not so small anymore, uh, that has gone down this path, or working with companies who have done that. So I'd like to uh, ask, what advice would you give to some company, some innovator? What's the, the most important expertise they should have or acquire? What's uh, the most important pitfall that they should avoid? Uh, start with Anand. So, so a couple of things. It's a good question. Um, if you first think at a structural level, uh, uh, what do I need to do as a software developer uh, uh, if I want to play in this space? Um, I remember the early days of software development when people introduced the concepts of design for testability. Design for scalability. These were all like 80s and 90s. You know, oh wow, you can actually you can drop little trails and string of pearls in your code to find out where the things are breaking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In many ways, this isn't any different. We've now extended that paradigm to say, I want design for privacy, or I want design for regulatory acceptance, and 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 that's not rocket science. The guidelines are there. There's enough examples, and so I would encourage developers uh, in this space to literally put on that kind of hat that says I'm going to design for X now, where X is now expanding. It wasn't just testability and scalability, but says, so that's one thing, just from a structural standpoint. Equally so on the structural standpoint, perhaps bullet number two is everybody who develops an application today, or everybody, the vast majority of them, use agile methods, uh, scrum, uh, extreme programming, whatever you like to call it. And What's important in that process is you don't want to go backwards and make it linear or waterfall uh, and go back to that old method of managing risk. I think there are ways to actually demonstrate uh, your systematic, each spiral you take in development, how you've uh, systematically removed or reduced risk, such that when you come to the point when you're walking into the FDA, if, if it's a note to file or if it's a class one or a class two, that it's almost like a PhD dissertation at that point in time, right? <laughs> you got to the end. They're going to shake your hand and say, congratulations, doctor, right? They're not going to send you back and say, oh my god, the last five years was a waste. Uh, and so I think managing risk along the way is a different way to think. Uh, so it's designed for risk mitigation or whatever you want to call it. And then last thing, I'll say this as a patient uh, 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 to all of you guys. Um, you can come out of school, you can come out of an interesting software program, and you can write all kinds of software for utilities and for games and entertainment, but we have an opportunity to change human lives in ways that have never been done before. Not even fathomable. 
I mean, I may leave home without my blood glucose meter, but I'll never leave home without my cell phone. I'll miss flights to go back and get my cell phone. It's become such an integral part of our lives. And I think there's almost a, a call to action here that says, uh, don't shy away from it because they have these guardrails. Uh, uh, embrace it, because I think not only is the opportunity immense, uh, you know, we don't, you don't do business cases in any other industry that have T's behind the dollar sign. And there are usually M's and B's, not T's. And that's what we're talking about, it's that kind of opportunity. But you have an opportunity to change human lives. And that's not to be forgotten in this. All right. Michael? I think um, there's this somewhat misleading sense that the younger generations don't care about the privacy of information, that they'll post anything on Facebook and Snapchat about who knows what, and, and, and it's all OK. And that leads people um, to think that developing new generation contemporary applications um, are really for the generation that doesn't care so much. That's, I think, false. And it's been shown over and over again that when people start to talk about their health care data, they feel very, very differently. And I think that people who are going to engage with health and fitness apps are going to expect more and more that those transition into their health, their wellness, health, and healthcare space. Designing for the most rigorous levels of privacy is kind of table stakes. It just has to be there. It's basic to any application that you're going to build. The good news is that it's not a Herculean burden. We don't see anyone who gets to us these days showing us a new app or application hasn't thought about it. And we very rarely have ones that are done so poorly that we kick them out. So I, I completely agree with Anant that um, this is the most exciting time to be in this digital, digital healthcare space that we have the capacity to, to change human history, to, to really change people's lives and outcomes. Don't get too tied up in, or I wouldn't think at all that I can't do this because I have to build some privacy and security so, you know, code into my software. It just needs to be thought of as you go along. Um, you know, we, we've been dealing with this tension for years again with healthcare where, where we were told back in 96 that people could no longer email us. Well, we had to be able to communicate with them, so people figured out how to do it. People will always figure out how to do these things in a reasonably secure, reasonably private way, and you just have to. You don't want to be on the other end of an OCR investigation that's going to cost you, you know, $25 million, $50 million. So do it, do it great, and just, you know, do the work to build the privacy and security into it from the get-go. Um, Bakul, uh, you, you gave some great advice to developers in your presentation before this panel that they should come and see you or see the FDA, uh, not at the last minute. But do you want to expand on that or offer your second favorite piece of advice? <laughs> so I think a lot of uh, Anand mentioned and hers, um, Reese mentioned as, as well as the word, you know, blank by design. You can put many things in there. And quality by design has been since you know, since Deming wrote the book on quality, um, safety by design has been there for a long time. Privacy by design. So, think about it as a design process. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of anecdote, and then um, I'll make this short. Uh, you know, when I, I I joined FTA six years ago, and I joined FTA, and and they said, "Oh, look, we have quality systems regulations which require people to do quality." And I looked at the the thing. I'm going, "How come?" We have to tell people to do that quality when it's common sense, when every engineering school teaches them to do the quality and to what Anand said. And it was really baffling for me. So I like spent like a year or two years sort of thinking about why. And then I talked to people and I'm going, it's not that common. I guess common sense is not common, which is probably <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, but on the, on the other hand, I think it, a lot of people do stuff, what the regulations talk about. It's really doing good engineering and sort of thinking about these things ahead of time as you're thinking. Just like, you know, think about it as dollars. If you think about it as dollars you're going to spend after the fact, you can save a lot of dollars if you design it right, if you think about those considerations up front as you're making the product, you're planning it, you're making a business plan. If you've missed that, and there are chances you'll miss it, but if you have a system in place to correct it, I think that helps you. The fundamental thing that FDA looks at, and maybe it's not taught in, in school, is 
uh, in engineering schools is, you know, don't just say that you're doing calling, but show somebody, so that somebody other than you can come and sort of say, or can check up on say, yes, we are doing calling, and here are the proof of it. Here's how I tested, here's how I planned it, here's how I did my, did my scrum, and this is how I managed my risk, and all that. So it doesn't tell you, I mean, so one biggest myth, if I may dispel, is people think the regulations are written by, you know, you got to have management, you got to have quality, you got to planning. It's not the sequence of events. It's about having those components built into whatever process you have for making products. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about it. And it's not about being scared about having this big giant regulation which talks about quality, but it's more about the intent is to make sure you have those components, however you want to do it, Scrum or you know, whatever, whatever methodology you use to make software, it doesn't matter. It, you still need to think about it from a customer perspective. If it's not the FTA, it's, it's somebody else going to ask you, show me your quality, or you'll ask yourself, where's the quality when you know, products come flying back to your shop. So think about it from that perspective. I'd like to invite the audience to offer questions. We have microphones in both of the aisles. Hi, I've been developing uh, medical devices for 40 some years, mostly class three medical devices, a lot in the respiratory care arena. Um, I've seen huge changes here in the last few years when we've all talked about it here on the panel about the fact that there is definitely an inflection point coming in this industry. We see these mobile equipments coming in, we see users getting involved with it. It's really an exciting time, all this data, what we're going to do with it, how we're going to model it, how we're going to improve everybody's outcomes. That's a granted. What hasn't changed is our speed. The medical device industry still works in cycles of years, and that includes the regulatory side of this as well. The cell phone side of it works in speeds of months. This is a huge disconnect. In your gentleman's opinion, both from industry and regulatory, what do you think we can do to help match this up? Because we're seeing a lot of disconnect. If it's going to take you know, nine months to get a 510K approval through for something, your phone that you were going to target is no longer even in production. How do you normalize these two vastly different systems at vastly different speeds? It's a great question. Who would like to answer? So I, I, maybe I'll start um, uh, having. So we have, we have uh, on our on our product we have a 510k class two uh, uh, clearance, um, but we also have two specials. Uh, uh, so we have two 510k specials. And one of the things that we learned along the way was that um, in addition to patient safety and good manufacturing process, there's this concept of intended use. You know, what is your product intended to be used for? And if the intended use doesn't materially change in that uh, matrix that Bakul put up, um, then, then you may still have to demonstrate and submit for your own quality system uh, a note to file, uh, you may have to go through a special process, uh, but you have different avenues to pursue. And so while our first clearance took eight, 20 months, arguably some of that 20 months was spent because neither of us really knew what we were doing at that time and what we should do, and that's fine, we learned. The, the, the first special we got took four and a half months, and the second special we got, where we converted operating systems or built a software, took 28 days. And, and so I say that as a real, okay, n equals one data point, okay, fine, it's, there's no pattern out of there, but it's, it's still a good data point, that we learned, and I think in many ways uh, the FDA has, dare I say, learned as well, that it's evolving, it's evolving with, because this is a much, as you said, this is a much faster moving industry than what medical device and pharma has been typically accustomed to long, long, long cycles. I say that as a point of hope because I think that the continued collaboration with not just the FDA, but the FTC, the National Science Foundation, NIH, all these people are coming together because they want to have some kind of common perspective on mobile health. I think the trajectory can be a positive one where we can gain time to market efficiencies. Next question. Hi, I work in security domain and my question about um, IoT device security and medical device security. 
the biggest problem that um, security community discuss when it comes to IoT devices is that security updates are not available, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know that the fact that your medical device is secure today doesn't mean that it's going to be secure even tomorrow because new security vulnerabilities are found all the time. So my question is to regulators, to Bakul and to Anand. Uh, so at a regulatory uh, level, how um, you achieve this? What kind of requirements, if any, you have to make sure that medical device actually support updates? And for Anand, my question is, do you do it practically? And what would be your recommendation how to do that? So I guess I'll go first. Um, so if you haven't seen our, the most recent guidance on cybersecurity, which we just published, um, I think a month ago, and we had a public workshop uh, about a couple of weeks, three weeks ago, talks about how to incorporate, uh, how to think about cybersecurity in your products as you're making them. So, and the contents uh, that we would want to see in the pre-market submission. Uh, so forcing people to include it in the pre-market part before they go to market, cybersecurity con considerations. So we've talked about that. So you should probably look at that as, as a starting point. Um, and you, you talked about, yes, uh, things change over time and a lot of stuff in that's, uh, that shows vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that shows up on devices happen post-market, not necessarily pre-market. But if you take care of the pre-market, you build your product sort of resilient to some of those things, uh, then you have a better chance of managing it in the post-market. And we've been repeatedly saying from the FTA perspective that managing cybersecurity risk in the post-market is not something that we are looking to sort of, uh, not just looking, but we have said, is it risk that you need to manage as part of your you know, pr product maintenance? And not as something that you're fixing because your product is broken. You're fixing because you're trying to put safeguards. You know, think about it as putting you know, fence and you know, making sure that your, your shutters are actually closed in, in, in case there's a typhoon that come, comes across your product. So we think of it from, from that perspective. And, uh, and we are all actually working on a guidance which will talk about the post-market sort of responsibility and expectations of when should it be considered as a recall versus not. But not, most of the time, if somebody says, oh, this could happen and has not happened, then we would say something you should sort of maintain as part of your product maintenance. So th this is a great question um, because this becomes a real problem on the, on the provider side of the equation. Yeah. Um, what happens not at all infrequently is a large um, class two, perhaps class three system um, that runs on a commercial operating system yep. needs a software upgrade. And the vendor says they need three months, six months to recertify and resubmit to you guys um, in order to get approval. And that leaves the organization exposed for that period of time. Um, they're, they're getting better about it, they're for, but still the cycle of these things coming out can be measured in weeks. And the faster they come out, the worse the vulnerability is they're trying to address. And it leaves the organizations exposed in a sometimes dangerous way for long periods of time. So it is a bit of a catch-22. Yeah. They can't throw these things at you guys and say, okay, you know, give us a, especially because some of them are sometimes significant operating system upgrades. But we've had ones where major healthcare IT companies have said we need six months to certify that it can take this relatively small OS patch. And we said we're not waiting six months. Yeah, so you, you, you're sort of raising. I mean, we spent two days talking about this in a public way, and we got all the, all the stakeholders engaging on this, on this very topic, and we could go two days more on this. But really, it comes down to like getting every stakeholder an early warning system that can sort of understand that this vulnerability is coming and building more time up front to sort of validate. Because I could, I could argue from, from just a neutral party and say, I would not, from a provider, if I was a provider and have a system, I would not want an untested patch or, or untested upgrade on my, on my network. That's one. I think it may actually expose you to an even worse situation than you were in the first place. So there's a responsibility on both sides of this fence uh, when you think about cybersecurity and the p people who are 
should definitely not take long, but at the same time, they should, they should always be testing for, so, um, for when, you, when you provide that upgrade. I mean, uh, that's common sense. It's n uh, not saying something that's from novel here. So, so totally agree. I mean, so use the scary example of there's the, you know, the servers that run the ICU monitoring yeah. systems, right? Yeah. And the, many of them just run Microsoft server software. All of a sudden, there's big vulnerability. Well, that's got to be you know, dealt with right then. Yeah, of we can't sit there. So if they've already validated it and tested it, because they knew 30 days in advance, and they've been doing it, and they say, OK, now you get to wait until FDA goes through it. I mean, it's just a, yeah, so like you, you, you've already had these conversations. Many yeah, times. no, no, we have. And we have said that for those kind of upgrades, it's not something if you need in clearance, because you need, you're maintaining a hole in your product, or actually patching up a hole in your product that you that your product is not changing intended use. I think it, when it goes from, oh no, I have to refactor my complete code, that's something that obviously you don't want to have non-tested stuff on your system, regardless of how much exposure you have. You're better off not fixing that's not broken. Right, but if you aren't under FDA regulation, some of the laws that I was talking about, the Federal Trade Commission guidelines and HIPAA, they speak about security in very broad, scalable, kind of mm -hmm. flexible terms. So there you're not going to have you know, a, a certification you have to obtain or a, a prescriptive requirement, but it does require that you take a, a thoughtful yeah. you know, approach to security risk assessment. I, I was just going to say at a practical level, um, so I agree with everything that's been said. One of the things that we've invested in over time is uh, unit level testing and regression testing that's automated. And because you will have, uh, you will have a number of these changes that come from left field, uh, but, and, and your job is then to deal with it. Uh, but the faster you can deal with it and demonstrate, uh, and it may be nothing that's uh, affecting your intended use, but you're going to run the test cases and show that, okay, I made the upgrade and I've checked it and all, it's all good. And your ability to do that in an automated sense uh, is ROI. Uh, yeah. It's uh, something that merits. Uh, and I, if, if there's a weakness that I see in the general software industry, there's not enough emphasis on that really smart uh, uh, unit level regression automated testing, that there's a huge opportunity to really get that engine because I mean, we see it every day. You pick up the paper and there's another hack and there's another hack and then there's another patch and there's another patch. And so it's, it's reality. It is accepted. So then the question is, well, how quickly can you adapt to it? Right? All right. A final, a final question? Thank you. So um, uh, there is one last, I think we have time, we do have one time for one last question. Uh, well, we can hear you, but I, no one else can. We'll so repeat if you it. could use the mic, that would be nice. Thanks for letting me squeeze that one in. Um, I would like to go to a point that Michael raised a short while ago, and it's probably very interesting that, you know, looking at the healthcare uh, system from a provider's eyes, uh, there's tendency, there'll be a tendency to trust the data generated from within the healthcare system to be of higher value and higher trustworthiness versus data generated by devices that are coming from outside the system. And in the short run, we may actually be seeing a class system of data where data from within the system has higher trust levels versus data that's coming from the outside. Is that a potential scenario that we might see in the short run uh, playing out, especially because uh, there is another entity, the healthcare insurers, that are required to take on financial and legal liabilities in terms of the, the prescription decisions that a, that a physician has to make. So he has to weigh the, you know, the, weigh the two, two sources of data, the provenance of the data, as you put it, um, and make a judgment, and, and there's obviously a liability and you know, responsibility behind that uh, decision. So how do you see that playing out in the short run? So um, we've been dealing with this really forever. Um, I get patients who come in all the time and they give me their you know, either spreadsheet or on paper of what their blood pressure readings have been at home. And I have a completely different reading from when they're sitting in front of me in the office. And I have to make the decision of, are they completely wrong and don't know how to use their home blood pressure cuff, or they're just hypertensive because they're so excited to see me. Um, <laughs> and, you know, heart rates are off. A, you know, it's a little bit more obvious when their weight is off by 40 pounds, but um, we just we just been doing this for a long time, and all providers figure out what data you can really trust and how much you can trust it. I think the, the trust level is going to go up 
in the very near future on the devices. Again, um, the devices are going to need to be validated at the um, UCSF at the Center for Digital Health Innovation. That's what we do a lot of. People come in with apps and devices, and they were designed by technologists, and we say, okay, that's great. How do you know it works with a human? How do you know it measures what you think it measures, and does it make a difference? And we go through validating all that. Over the next couple of years, as we get experience with that, and there are more, these become more commonplace, um, I think that issue of can I trust this is going to get to be much lower, and there will be you know, whether it's FDA or there's some standard that evolves, people are going to get much more comfortable with it. Um, and again, the generation that's coming up considers this stuff real. So, um, the comfort level will go up. Just one other quick comment about the privacy. And we've been focusing around you've got to build the privacy in. The privacy is critically important, which is absolutely true. We should just all be realistic that privacy is not free either. It's a huge cost, not only the cost that you guys have to spend to build all this in, which is certainly important, as we said, has to be done. But individually, while we're trying to protect our privacy, we've also put in barriers that decrease the ability to exchange the information, that cost us billions of dollars to create the ability to aggregate the information that would be much simpler if we had a national patient identifier that we don't have. So it's a, it's a very important discussion, the privacy discussion, but we shouldn't just look at it as it's our obligation to protect all the data. It's also our obligation to think about it from a little bit of a higher level holistically of what do we really want as a society, what's the right level of protection of our information. If we lock everything down, it doesn't become mobile, the data doesn't move anywhere, that's no good. If we let anyone in, that's no good. But we've historically been left in this place where there is no easy way to move data around. There's no easy way for me to know who is who when they show up in the office because we don't have a national patient identifier that most other countries do have. And that's an output of, of the way we've designed privacy in the U.S., driven by you know, a relatively small, very vocal group. So it's something worth learning about and figuring out how you individually think that should be addressed. Well, thank you. You've been very generous with your time and expertise. Please join me in thanking our, our panel.